Praise the Lord. As they get the lights on, please go ahead and grab your seats right there. Hallelujah. And open your Bibles to James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter. Now, we started a series last week entitled, Wait for It, and we were talking about patience. And what we've been talking about, I want to say this because I kind of got a little feedback from everybody this morning. Make no mistake about it. God's desire is to put a huge blessing in your lap. God's desire is to help you overcome your shortcomings. God's desire is to answer your prayers. Come on, that is God's desire. Don't make any mistake about it. We're not talking on and, and preaching on patience because we want you to think that God's holding it back from you. Did you hear me this morning? Listen, we're not talking about we're not talking about this because we want you to think, oh man, you know, most people hate talking about patience. Most people hate it. But I'm gonna say this: this is probably the most relevant topic you will ever have to uh, uh, really grab a hold of in your life. Because if you don't have patience, you're never going to achieve the fullness of God in your life. And I don't care what church you go to. I don't care who else tells you that. Without faith and patience, you can't have anything. You can't. You're not going to get it just by osmosis. Most of the things that we get in our life uh, from the th are the things of God are not by osmosis. Now, there, don't get me wrong. There are things we get just by being in his presence. There are a lot of things that we get, but most of the, I mean, even when Jesus was here on the earth, most of the people that got healed didn't just get healed because they were standing there where he was at. Most of the people that got delivered when Jesus himself was here, didn't just get it by just going to the meeting. And if you go and look in the, in the, uh, in the book of Acts, same thing happened. It didn't just happen. And this is where I, I believe the church has really missed it because we've taught on just get to church. And a lot of people think that just by being in a service where the worship is good or the preaching is good is enough. It's not. If it was, listen, Y'all know that there are churches that have 25 and 30,000 people in them. There are churches that have 60. The biggest church in America is 60 some thousand. Joel Osteen, pretty good. Not bad. Y'all know that there are a lot of people that go to those churches that still have loads of problems. L loads. And they're there with the best worship and the best programs and some of the best preaching. Y'all get the best preaching every week, but they, they're there with some of the best preaching. And, they, and, and nothing fixed them. Come on, somebody. That ain't fixing them. That's not what it is. It's not about a program. It's not about a church. It's not about, work. It's not about your band. It's not about that. It's not about how, how good the preaching is. It's about your faith and your patience. And this is one of the most relevant topics in a Christian's life ever. Faith and patience. And in James, he makes a statement here. In chapter 1, verse number 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come, or, come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now they have it up there on the screen in the New King James. It says this, go, go back one. It says, count it all joy. And I said it last week, yay. Yeah. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Can you do that, really? Well, through faith and patience, you sure can. Come on, somebody. Why? Verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance or patience has a chance to grow. Verse, it says it here on the screen, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, I said last week that word produces does not mean give or cause it to appear. Okay, what it means is it causes it to increase. It works it like a muscle, all right? So verse 4 says, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, 
lacking nothing. Now, I do want to say this. I'm not saying that everything that you're going to encounter in your life when you pray and ask God for something is going to take a long time. Come on now. How many of you know when you got saved, you didn't have to wait for that? You said the prayer and instant. Come on. Instantly, you're saved. There are a lot of times we pray for healing, instant manifestation. There are a lot of things we pray for that happen over the next few days. Real quick. If I had an opportunity, I could probably start handing out the microphone and let you all go around the room and give us a testimony. I prayed and this happened real fast. I prayed and this turned around. I did this and, and, and I asked God for help and he helped me. Okay? But I want to say this, and I, I hope you get this and really understand what we're trying to really help you with here is this. When you ask for big, big things... If you've never believed for something really big, big before and seen it show up before, then you better be prepared to wait a little while. Why? Well, if you already had the faith to produce big things, you'd already be, come on, walking in the big things. And so you have to give your faith the right atmosphere to work. Okay? Arnold Glasgow said this, the key to everything is patience. You get the chicken by hatching the egg, not smashing it. Now, some of you are like, you don't know, brother. I can pray for anything, and it just happens. Well, how come you ain't driving that Rolls Royce yet? How come you ain't living in that big mansion yet? Well, I, I wouldn't if I could. Well, I mean, if you believe it, the one you just, you know, how come that's not happening? I just pray and things happen. I pray and things happen too. <laughs> but I also know where my faith and my patience is at right now, and I'm trying to extend it so I can walk in a greater blessing. <laughs> I'm trying to expand it. All right? Patience keeps believing even when things look worse. Oh, I don't want it to look worse. Well, if you're walking in patience, it doesn't matter how it looks. I think there's a scripture in the Bible that says we walk by faith and not by... So when it looks worse, patience will keep believing even when it looks worse. Now, when that happens, when things look worse and you bail, you weren't really believing anyway. When you quit and give up, you weren't really believing it was going to work anyway. When you start looking to make it happen yourself, you weren't believing it anyway. The one who believes when things look worse, those are the people that really believe. Okay? Now, I said this last week. I'm going to say it again because it bears repetition. And I can't believe I just used that phrase. Bears repetition. Not all the promises of God are instantly enjoyed, even though they are ours. Not all of them, not all of them are instantly enjoyed. Salvation is instantly enjoyed, isn't it? You know, baptism of the Holy Spirit was, you know, some of us tarried a little bit, but it, it was instantly enjoyed, and we enjoy it every day. Peace of God, a lot of times, you know, is instantly enjoyed. But, you know, there are a lot of things that aren't. Abraham and Sarah were promised children. Now, yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> Go, walk out and look at the sky, Abraham. Now, you see how many stars there are up there? That's how many kids you're going to have. Now, now I, I don't know about you. Now, I've been to places where there is no light pollution and really got a chance to look at stars. In Tulsa, an hour south of Tulsa, we have a ranch, uh, and we used to do youth camps down there. And we would, after the kids were all in bed and we're out doing the, you know, security rounds and stuff on the golf carts or whatever, and we'd drive out and just look up and, and listen to me, we're in the... <laughs> Bigfoot country. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing out there. <laughs> and you look up, and it, those stars were so bright, and suddenly there were so much more than what you could see in the city. 
And you get out there, and literally you can see the bands of the Milky Way. And it was like, how come I don't see that on a regular basis? Now, this is the kind of thing Abraham's looking at. There is no light pollution in Abraham's day. So he's seeing the stars for what they are and how many there really are. Now, you think about that. This is how many children you're going to have, Abraham. Really? Because I'm 90, and Sarah's 70, and we have none. Now, catch this, y'all. Sarah wasn't able to have children when she was 20. Now she's being told, you're going to have children when you're 70. Okay. <laughs> now you'd think that would be enough to just rattle your cage right there and, and, and shake you to your foundation. But check this out, y'all. Sarah at 70 gets a promise, you're going to have children. And she goes to 75, nothing. 80, come on, nothing. 85, nothing. <laughs> now, they got time to think about this. They've had 70 years up to now, and now they, here's another 10. You just thought about it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> At this stage of the game, she has a choice to make. Verse number 11, it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. Now, the King James says it this way, she judged him faithful who had promised. So once the judgment of God being faithful has happened, patience is what will keep that judgment in place. Can you imagine Sarah and Abraham going to the doctor? We just want to get a little checkup here. Oh, it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, we believe in helping the senior citizens stay, you know, active. No, 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 we're expecting a child. <laughs> what? Somebody told a story about Brother Hagen. If you don't know who Brother Hagen is, Kenneth Hagen Sr. is who I, I'm talking about, and he was the founder of the ministry I had the honor of working for for 11 years where I went to school and before he passed away at 86, around 83, he was, they were, uh, they had their own plane, and we'd flown on it a few times when we worked there with, with uh, the Hagens, and they were coming back from a crusade, and he had his feet up, and uh, they were, you know, now, now you have to remember, they'd finish a meeting, and then get on the plane, and they'd fly home, and be at home that night. Well, if they're on the West Coast, you're getting home 3, three o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, depending on how long the meeting went. And so they get on the plane, I think they were in California, flying back to, or maybe even Washington, flying back to Tulsa. It's a two or three hour flight. And, and these, this person was telling the story, said that he had his feet up, kicked back in a chair, they had pizza, <coughs> and they're all laughing and cutting up. And they said, and he was 83, I think, at the time. They said, they said, you know, Brother Hagen, a lot of men your age aren't, ripping through the night air at 500 miles an hour, eating pepperoni pizza at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said, yeah, a doctor says a lot of people my age are dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is what we're talking about. This is the age that Sarah is supposed to be having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and time to think about how crazy that is. All right, I believed it there for a year or two because I was 70. I'm still feeling pretty good. Just taking my vitamins every day. Still, you know, walking. But man, I'm 85 now. What's going on here? Nope. Her patience held true. I judged him faithful, and it looks worse now than it did 15 years ago. But you know what? I'm having a baby. How does this work? A few weeks ago, I uh, had the, uh, Jody and I finally upgraded our phones. Been, it had been a while, uh, two years, so we decided we were going to get the new iPhone 7. 
Hallelujah. All you droid people, I'll pray for you. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> so I, um, I ordered it. And uh, we'll order Jody's at the same time. And it comes up, and, and Jody says, it says on Jody's, say, we'll be shipping in three days. And you should have it by, and it was a week, I think, for Jody's phone to get her. Well, y'all, y'all know Jody's significantly smaller than me. She's a little, little bitty, cute little. Mm. Anyway, um, <laughs> she's small, and I'm not. Okay? And so I can't, I, I can't use those little toy phones. I, I love these big ones. <laughs> So I ordered the plus, okay? So I got on there and I ordered it. And, and I was so excited because I got on right as soon as the, the thing opened up. I was, bam, first, you know. And so Jody's in a week, and I was like, yes, I'm going to get mine in a week too. And so I, I go through the thing. I process the, you know, I put in my credit card information, and I pay for it. And it comes up and it says, yours will arrive in three and a half weeks. And I was like, dang it. <laughs> now that's not fair. She got hers in like four days after we ordered it. And, and mine, I got to wait 21 and, and plus days before I get mine. Now listen, when the six came out, I had to wait three months. I was beside myself. I was pacing back and forth and like, oh my gosh. Not, yeah, God likes her more. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I think Apple just likes her more. And so, so I, 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 Ordered mine, got the receipt. It definitely hit my credit card. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I saw that. Money had been withdrawn from the account. And now I had to sit and wait three weeks with no phone. But now here's the question. D was the phone mine? How do I know it was mine? Well, I had a receipt that showed I paid for it. Come on. And so I had it. It's mine. It's not sitting in my hand. So what did I do? I walked around the house anxiously expecting the UPS man to show up anytime. Not, I wonder if that's coming. I wonder if it's going to get, I wonder if, it, if it, you know, if, if maybe Steve Jobs' ghost just doesn't like me and just doesn't want me to have it. I mean, I wonder if, it's, if something's going to happen. Now, let me ask you a question. If in those three weeks... I get tired of waiting, and I decide I'm going to move to Cupertino, where the Apple headquarters is, so I can be closer. Come on now, watch this. Closer to, the, to where it's going to ship from. Maybe I can just catch it when it comes out the door. <laughs> and I don't tell nobody. I don't put no forwarding address on there. I just go there, thinking this makes sense to me. I get flighty, and I go. I don't tell nobody, just leave my house, you know, pull up everything, nothing there, no forwarding address, just go. What happens? Am I going to get that phone? No, probably not. It's going to show up at my house and sit on my front porch, and in our neighborhood, it has happened. People walk by and just take your shipment right off your front porch. Anybody else ever have that happen? We had gift cards had that happen. Walked. And we were still living there. <laughs> so it, it's, it's going to go to somebody else. Because I didn't have the patience, I decided I needed to move in order to get what I wanted. There's people doing this with God all the time. They, get, they find it in the Word, they find a promise, they get a calling or whatever, and things don't happen fast enough for them even though the word that God speaks to us has already been paid for. Come on, somebody, you got to catch this. It's already been paid for, and you have a receipt to prove it. You have a receipt, come on, somebody, to prove it. You ain't catching this. Listen, if anybody wants to argue with me whether or not I, got, I had an iPhone 7 or not, all I had to do was print off the paperwork and go up and say, look right here, see where it says right there, pay it in full, and this is coming to my house. I have an iPhone 7. Well, do you have it in your hand head? Nope, but I own one. This is what patience is. 
You have been given a word from God that's already, ugh, I, can't, I, I wish I could get this out the way it's in me right now. It's already been paid for. It's already, it's already purchased, and it's been given to you. Now, I'm not just talking about salvation. I'm not just talking about heaven when you die. I'm talking about the blessings of God that we all need in our life. What is it that you need? I need a new job. Well, there are scriptures in here that will back that up and help you. And guess what? They've already been paid for. Come on. I, I need to get healing in my life. I've been sick. And, well, there are scriptures in here that, that says that's yours and it's already been paid for. Well, you know, we need to grow our church. There are scriptures, come on somebody, that are in here that talk about that and they've already been paid for. And guess what? When you start saying they're mine, now what you do is you just sit back and wait for the UPS man to show up at the front door and go, kum, kum, kum. I need you to sign for this. <laughs> Here you go. Here's what you've been waiting for. And that's what patience does. It knows something. It knows that what you have is yours. That what has been promised to you is yours. All right? Your faith, come on, places an order. Jesus already paid for it. You have a paper receipt called the Bible, and patience is keeping you there till what you have shows up and you can put your hands on it. It's patient that walks over to the door and opens it up, and the UPS driver hands it to you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 36 says this, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. you got to have it. Not, not a suggestion. Come on. Not, well, you know, uh, I mean... Uh, I'm just not strong in patience. That's why he's saying this. You need it. Because if you're ever going to walk in the real blessing, you can't just pull up and, and quit and expect God to still give it to you. Some of you have been believing for healing and, and, and things. Don't stop. You keep believing. Why? So when your faith, come on, has worked all the way through to the end, you'll be able to receive the healing in your body. If not, you're going you're to short-circuit that before you get it. If you don't, work. let your patience work. When you finally get to the place that you should have been going all the time, you're not going to have anything there waiting for you. You're going to walk away from the blessing. Sometimes, there's a quote I want to read to you. Sometimes the ship that is longest on its voyage brings home the richest treasure. If the promise tarries, wait for it. A promise long waited for is very precious in its fulfillment. So now what do we do? Well, we don't sit around idly by, miserably waiting. Like, oh my God, this is awful. Listen, once I knew that I, I'd paid for this and I knew the money had come out of my account, <laughs> I sat there like a little kid on Christmas morning like, yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And anybody would talk about their phones, I'd be like, I got, I got a seven. And they'd be like, do you have it on you? And I'd be like, no, it's coming. <laughs> what are we doing? Last week we said patience is cheerful endurance. Waiting because we know it's coming and we're actually excited about it. Some of you that are sitting around waiting on the blessings, this is how you're waiting. <laughs> Let me say this. This is not in my notes anywhere. You start blaming other people. Start questioning yourself. Where have I missed it? Where have I gone wrong? Well, if they would just done this. Well, it's your fault. Come on. What do we do while we're waiting? Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Now, hold on right here. Can you really do that? <laughs> Can you really have glory in the middle of a trial and, and the hard times? Can you really be happy and shout glory and really experience the presence of God? Can you really be in the worst possible state and really still go, God, you're good and I worship you? And him just step in the room and go, hi. I know you're going through a hard time. I love you. Just be patient. Can, you, can that really happen? According to this, it can. Why? Knowing that tribulation, that word tribulation is trial, produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character. Now, underline this last word right here because this is big. Hope. Verse 5. Catch it. Now, hope may not disappoint. Is that what it says? Hope might make it okay. Hope might bring through, it might deliver, might, maybe. If everybody does their job and does everything right, and we just happen to line the stars up perfect and hit a home run today, it might, come on, somebody, that's not what that says. It says hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given who was given to us you know what that word hope means it doesn't mean a wish like boy I I sure hope let me cross my toes too I sure hope so it's not what that means the word hope means to expect something to happen happily Expect something to happen happily. So what are we doing? We're just sitting by going, oh my God, I hope this works. No, we're sitting there going, it's coming, it's coming. I'm next, I'm next, I'm next, (laughs) I'm next. The other day, I was sitting, I was here Friday, sat back there where Darnell sitting in, in the sound booth and was working on some stuff on my computer had some worship music on, and it was one of those moments where God just, and man, you know what I'm talking about? Where God just, (laughs) literally almost, like you don't want to look because you're afraid you'll jinx it, but it's like you can feel him standing right there next to you. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to understand what I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. (laughs) Did you catch that? You need to understand this. You need to understand that God wants, you, wants to have that kind of relationship with you where he invades your space and he comes in and, and gets real close. And, and, and let me tell you what that is. When we had my iPhone 7, I remember the day that I got the email that says, it has shipped and here is your tracking number and you can see where it is. And I watched it come from Cupertino, to Memphis, down to Miami. I don't know why it went to Miami. Or maybe it was Tampa. Went to Tampa. Then it came to Orlando, past my house. It went past my house to come up here. Then it went down to Haines City. And then they put it on the truck and it came to my house. I watched it. Ding, ding, ding. You know, you can click, do you want to receive updates? I click, ding, yes, I want updates. And every time it hit a checkpoint, I was my phone was going off. All right? Let me tell you what that, that's what that was back there. The Holy Spirit showed up. And he goes, your blessing's been shipped. And this is what I'm talking about. If you will just wait and stay in the presence of God, you're getting ready to hear a word that goes, get your little email that says, your blessing's been shipped. It's on its way. And that's what the presence of God does. It just makes you, it's, he's, it's on its way. Why? Because patience will prove your faith in God. Wow, overwhelming amen on that one. Patience will prove your faith in God. 
Now listen, God has already proven his love and his faith towards us. Come on, without question. Y'all know he, how many of you really question whether or not God loves you? Nobody does. <laughs> it's like, d d uh, really? I mean, I mean, he sent his son to die for you. An agonizing, horrible death. He's proven it. He's proven how much he has faith in us. I mean, he has faith in you, whether you do or not. He believes in you. Well, how do you know that? Well, you're still here, aren't you? Come on. Is your, are your lungs still filling with air? You know why that is? Because God has faith in the human race. That's why he created us, to be his kids. He believes in us and, and, and made us all with a purpose. And he said, you know what? If they never do it, I believe they can. I'm going to make them do it. I'm going to make them so they can do it, not force you to do it. I'm going to make you, create you so that you can. And so he's created us, given us life, given us abilities, given us talent. Come on, somebody. He believes in us. He loves us. But now here's the thing. We have not proven our love and faith to him. We haven't. This life right here that you're living, the day-to-day -day struggles that you have, everything that we do here is our opportunity to prove our faith and our love to God. And, and, and this is where people get disillusioned. We think it's just supposed to be easy. If I just move my hand, unicorns and rainbows are going to appear and smoke's going to fly out and things are just going to happen. It's not. Just because you show up somewhere doesn't mean that you're just going to, here I am. Okay. <laughs> what do you want us to do about that? You have to have faith and patience. Why? I'm going to ask you a really hard question. Why should we rule and reign in God's kingdom forever, being kings ourselves, who he is the king of? Y'all know that phrase, you know, king of kings. He's talking about us. We're the of kings. Amen. Somebody should have shouted on that. Okay. He's the king over. Why should we have access to him be able to call him Father, why should we get the reward of life after death in heaven? Why? When there are other created beings who right now have a whole lot more power than we do. Why do we, or why are we the ones that get to enjoy, come on, the reward? Why? Here it is. Because in the midst of trials, in the midst of storms, in the midst of hard times, in the midst of demonic oppression, in spite of how we feel, in spite of death all around us, in spite of everything, we chose to believe Him still. Jesus died for us with nobody, no guarantees that anybody was ever going to take Him up on it. Listen, he could have died, and, that's, and he did, but he could have died, and the whole world could have still said, nah, not interested, and we'd all still go to hell. His death is pointless unless somebody, come on, believes it. So why do we get to enjoy the things that the other created beings don't? Why do we get to rule and reign in heaven? Because we believed it. And when somebody else told you, that's not going to work, we said, nope, I don't believe you. I believe him. Come on. When somebody else, when some other situation rose up its ugly head against you and said, you're going to die this time. No, I'm not. I don't believe that. I believe this. Oh, what you're doing is wasting your time. It's weak and, and barely making any impact at all. It just quit and give up and run away. No, I believe I'm called. I believe I'm doing it. And God said it, so it's going to happen. Other people are limited by time or by what the knowledge that they have in their mind or what they think should happen. 
They'll give you every excuse under the sun of what this expert says and what this news program says, what this health person says, and what this study shows, and what my degree taught me, and what my experiences over here taught me, and what this church that I came out of says, and, you know, this is the way we used to do it where I went to church growing up, and I didn't grow up believing that way. I grew up Catholic, so what you're talking about is crazy to me. Every excuse under the sun, they'll tell you everything. But the people that really are going to enjoy the rewards that God has promised us are the ones who said, I don't care what mankind says. I'm going by what God says, whether it's in the Bible or whether it's in my heart. And God spoke it to me directly. If God said it to me, I'm believing that, and you're not going to talk me out of it. Okay? I don't care if it makes me look weak. I don't care if other Christians got it wrong. I don't care what other people have treated, people treated you bad. I don't care. That doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you've lost everything before. I'm sorry that that happened, but that's not what God's word says. I'm not believing that. I don't care if you've lost everything in the recession. My God says all of my needs will be met according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I, I don't care if everybody in your family's died of liver cancer. I'm healed because 1 Peter 2.24 says I am. Amen. Come on. I don't care if depression is running rampant in the country right now and they put it in the water to make us all more depressed or any other conspiracy theory you want to go on. You can tell me anything you want. I don't care. The joy, come on, of the Lord is my strength. I have access to it. That's what I believe. Amen. And if I believe that... I'm going to walk in that. And that belief is what gives him the right, God the right, to give us the place of ruling in his kingdom forever. Now Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 12 says this, Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are, giving, are going to inherit God's promise because of their... Faith and patience. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we might. We shall reap if what? We faint not. Now listen, there must be an opportunity to faint. <laughs> What's faint mean? Quit. Lay down. Stop. This is important. If you're taking notes, write this down. Faith works without you knowing it. Faith works without you knowing it. If you know it, you don't need faith. Faith will work without you knowing that it's working. It's going on by, listen, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, and I don't have time to get into that right now, but when Jesus cursed the fig tree, and this is real quick, they went on their way and didn't notice that it was dead till the next day. When they came back, then they went, huh. What's that mean? That means as soon as he spoke it to the time they came back, the power of God was working on the fig tree. Did they know it? Nope. Jesus knew it, but they didn't. Faith will work without you knowing it. So your patience needs to give faith the time and space to work in. If you, get, if you quit, all the work that you've done up to now will be wasted, and it just turns to garbage. If you quit and give up, everything you've done up to now just wasted. Throw it away. Proverbs 24.10 says it this way, if you fall under pressure, your strength is small. If it goes longer than you think, are you going to quit and undo everything that you've been doing? I mean, I think about this a lot. We've been calling in 150 people to this church for at least three years of the four. At least three. And some of you get disappointed and go, why aren't you calling 500? 
where would we put 500 right now? Where, where? Where would we put that? Where would that happen? Well, go to multiple services. Uh, let's get to 150 first there, big shot. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm limited to just 150 people. 150 is the first step. Come on. On a giant uh, staircase going to the top of the Empire State Building. Come on, somebody. I'm believing for 150 people. All right? And, I, and I'll be honest with you. I'm disappointed we aren't there yet. Four years into it, I'm disappointed. Now, that doesn't mean I'm disappointed with you. I'm just disappointed that we're not there. I told you all last week or week before, I, I'm grateful for every one of you. You're an answer to our prayers. All right? But if I, and, I, and, 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 and just to be, I'm going to be transparent. I thought about quitting. I thought about finding somebody else to pastor this church. I've thought about it. Me. <laughs> not him. Me. <laughs> Some of you go, oh, God, what? calm down. I said I thought about it. <laughs> Didn't say I'm going to. But now here's the thing. If I did, I'd undo three and a half years of believing for 150 people. What kind of, what is that? That means my faith is weak. My strength is weak. What happened? I'm doing this all on my own if I give in. That's just my strength. That's what I can do. But thank God this ain't about what I can do. <laughs> this is about following instructions and letting him do what he can do. Amen. Come on. And so my faith, I have to just make it settled in my heart. My faith's working even though I don't know it's working. There are things going on in the spirit realm and behind the scenes that my faith is doing. I have no idea. Same thing for you. There are things you've been believing for for a long time right now. Your faith is doing, and you don't even know it. Your faith's moving mountains out of the way. You don't even know it. And the big mountain that you can see that you're believing to get out of the way, your faith's already moved 10 small ones that you, just to get to the big one. Come on, it's already moved 100 little molehills. Come on, just to get to the big one. If it goes longer than you think, are you going to undo everything that you have done by quitting? Now, I'm going to finish with this. Pressure is not the indicator of something not working. You feel pressure? That's no indicator that your faith isn't working. A lot of people, this is why people are disillusioned. They'll think, I, I mean, I'm feeling pressure. I mean, where am I missing it? You're not. Oh, but it's got to, it has to, it's got, that's, that's no, that's no, that is no, no indicator. The great New England preacher Philip Brooks was noted for his poise and quiet manner. At times, however, when he suffered moments of frustration and irritability, uh, one day a friend saw him feverishly pacing the floor like a caged lion. He walked up to him and he said, What's the trouble, Mr. Brooks? He said, The trouble is that I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. <laughs> That's us. You need to start looking at it this way. You are closer to the answer now than you have ever been before because all that waiting is behind you. Come on, somebody. You're closer now and you're, you can't refute that. You're closer now than you did when you started. No matter how you feel, no matter what is looking you in the face, no matter what the pressure coming and saying, I have to have an answer now. Do you believe God more right now than what is staring you in the face? Things are going to ratchet up pressure on you. Oh, the rent is due. Your lease is coming up. This is what this place told me. This is what I'm afraid I'm going to have to do. I have to be out in three weeks. I got to do something right now. I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to. When you're in faith and pressure comes, listen to me, this is huge. Pressure is not the indicator that God is not working to help you. Pressure is a distraction trying to get your attention away from God working to help you. 
And people are buckling under that pressure all the time instead of being strengthened on the inside by the word that God said he wants to do in their life. Turn to 1 Samuel 13. We're going to quit. Now, let me tell you this story. I'm going to set this up for you. The children of Israel are going to war, and the Philistines are there. And they come out with 3,000 chariots with 6,000 charioteers. All right? Men of Israel are freaking out because, see, they couldn't go to war without pro the prophet Samuel coming out to burn the sacrifice and then go, all right, the Lord is with you, now go. And they'd go out, and that's why, they were, that's why Israel was so awesome. They'd go out with these small numbers and wipe out kingdoms way more powerful and way bigger than they were because the blessing of the Lord was upon them. And so they're there, and they're freaking out. Because Samuel's not there, and there's the Philistines staring him in the face with 3,000 chariots and 6,000 charioteers looking at him. Let's go right now. You're ours. Ha <laughs> ha. And they're like, and, and Saul's like, we can't go until Samuel gets here and gives a sacrifice. We can't do it. We can't go. We can't go without the word of God. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Let's go to, uh, skip on down a few verses there, uh, uh, verse number seven. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad. Now, we're talking about Israelites and Gilead. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days. Now, we're not talking, you know, seven days and then the, the, the Philistines showed up. Philistines are there. And Saul waits seven days. Okay? He waits, se waits there seven days for Samuel. Now look at this next part. As Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. All right, now here's the thing. Pressure. Pressure from the Philistines. We're going to kill you, take your land, take all your possessions. Pressure from his men jumping and bailing ship. Deserting. The army is deserting him. That's a lot of pressure. I mean, how would you like to be the king that, that allowed Israel to be destroyed? That's pressure. All right? Verse 9. This is where he missed it. Saul, so, so he demanded, bring me the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. What did he do? Took it upon himself, went against what the word of God was. Come on. Made sense. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, they're, they're there and the army's leaving. And I got to do something. Come on, i got to be out of my house in three weeks. I better jump on the first thing I can find. I mean, I mean, I mean, we might have to move out of here at the end of November. I mean, even though you told them you want to stay a year and they don't want you to, they don't want to do a year. They want you to do three more. And, and, and what are we going to do? And we're gonna... Lord told me to tell them one year. I told them a year. I'm going to just calm myself. I'm not going to listen to the pressure. Now look at this. Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Look what happens in verse 10. Just as Saul was finishing the burnt offering, that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. The other translations say it this way, just as Saul was finishing the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. What happened? The fulfillment of the promise showed up. Now listen to me, guys. The stronger the pressure is, the closer you are to your answer. Why can you say that? It looks like it's further away. Well, who is the distractor? The devil. 
He's the one trying to get you to settle for something less. And if he's putting pressure on you, trying to turn your head, why does he do it? Well, he knows the answer's right there, so he's trying to get you to look somewhere else. And when it's so strong on you, and it's so, that's the moment you need to throw up your hands and say, God, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I'm just going to worship you right now anyway. You are the peace, you are my rock, you, and you just turn it over to him. And when you do that, you're, you're literally, the answer is there. And you're getting ready to run into it. Some of you, by the end of the day today, might run into the answer you've been believing for, but you can't quit. You can't give up, and you can't be doubting. Oh, man, I hope so. That ain't going to get it done. As soon as Saul bent to the pressure he was feeling was the moment that Samuel showed up. But, 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 but I, I mean, I, and you can give me any excuse under the sun, I have used those same excuses and still use them today. I have a PhD in those excuses. I'm really good at them. Have them memorized. But I want you to catch this, and then this is how we'll end it. Time is a construct that God created. And if God created it, he can bend it. He can change it. He can cause it to stand still and in the face of pressure, that doesn't mean God's word is not so or any less true. It's actually closer to manifesting in your presence than it ever has been before. So what do you do? Sit back and wait for the doorbell? Yes. What do I do? Just sit back and wait for the delivery? Yes. Don't get flighty and try and make something happen yourself. If God told you to do it, it's his responsibility to supply you with the, what it takes to get there, and you just need to sit back and go, okay, God, it's mine. Your word says it's mine. You need to walk around with your little iPhone receipt in your hand and be like, look, it's coming. It's mine. This is what you need to do with your situation. It's already bought. It's already paid for. You need to just sit back now and wait for the delivery man. Because it's on the way. And his word, come on, never fails. How do we get it? Faith, come on, and patience. Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're going to pick up here next week. One more week. This is what God says. It's yours. Come on. This is what God purchased, Jesus' blood purchased. Don't try and make it happen yourself. Wait. Your flesh is screaming, get it now. Got to have it now. But your faith is saying, if you wait, it'll be great. And that's a word for somebody. I don't know who that is, but if you'll wait, it'll be great. Don't wait panicking. Wait rejoicing. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to see your word work. See your word come to pass. And I'm so glad. Father, I pray today that you'll help us not buckle under the pressure, that you'll help us, Lord God, stand strong in the face of pressure because we're in, undergirded by your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And if your word is true, no matter what we're facing, it'll happen. As long as we believe and hold fast. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, if you're here today, you don't know the Lord, you don't have the faith I'm talking about. This is your opportunity to have faith placed on the inside of you that's bigger than you. And so whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, doesn't seem to be overwhelming, doesn't seem to be something that's going to take you down. 
You can see it the way God sees it. So if you don't know the Lord today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer from up here. I'd love for you to say that prayer with me right there at your seat and invite Jesus into your heart so that he can be Lord of your life. Say this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I come to you today a sinner, but I believe that Jesus is your son, and I believe that you raised him from the dead. I believe that he is Lord of all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer with me this morning, you're now a new person. And the Bible says that you now have fruit inside of you of the Spirit. And that fruit, one of the fruits is patience.